Welcome to Power Up, the uptime podcast focused on the new hot off the press technology that can change the world. Follow along with me, Alan Hall, and Itasaur's Phil Totaro as we discuss the weird, the wild, and the game-changing ideas that will charge your energy future. Well, our first patent idea is from our friends over at Orsted, and they are looking at a, a really novel approach of installing wind turbine blades vertically rather than the horizontally, which is we do today, offshore. Uh, so if you've watched offshore blades being installed, you've always seen them placed horizontally and slid towards the hub and everybody tightens them on. Well, that requires a lot of really tall cranes to, to make that happen. But what Orsted's thinking about is grabbing the blade kind of by the bottom and lifting it up vertically. Uh, in order to do this, you need a pretty rigid frame to hold this crane to keep it from the blade stabilized so the crane doesn't move too much. And it's, it's, it's kind of a complicated mechanical problem. However, it does require a much shorter crane. And that is the benefit. And getting big cranes out at sea right now is really hard, Phil. So having a short crane with a much stronger crane head, I'll call it, uh, does make a lot of sense. It does. And and so just for context, you know, we talked a couple of weeks ago about, you know, Equinor getting a, a patent on, you know, technology around uh, optimization of floating platforms. This is another example of a, a development and independent power producer company, you know, Orsted, getting IP themselves that they control uh, on something related to, you know, the, the business that they do on a daily basis. Um, and the reason I'm bringing this up is it's a, it's a bit unique in the wind energy sector because most of the particularly important patents have been held in the past by the OEMs or other supply chain companies. So for you know a company like Orsted to to even contemplate doing this um, is is fascinating. This is still in the conceptual phase. Um, there's no rig that they've built yet. They've probably done some smaller scale bench testing, potentially. They've certainly done, you know, plenty of computer modeling on, on this sort of thing, um, you know, to get it this far. Um, but it is, as Alan mentioned, an interesting concept because, you know, the, the blade's moment of inertia, you know, when it's in the vertical position, it, it has the opportunity to potentially flop around or tip over. Um, but the counter to that is, as Alan mentioned as well, you need a much shorter crane boom. And so, you know, these are some of the technical challenges that, that Orsted is trying to address with introducing this kind of technology. Um, I guess the question maybe for Joel is, is does this seem practical and, and how attractive is this going to be? I think from an operational standpoint, so for real world value of a patent, and this will happen eventually. And I don't think it's limited to offshore. I think it will happen onshore as well. And, and I'm saying this based on the global build out of wind farms, onshore, offshore floating, you name it, what we're doing and the goals we have in place. <clears throat> All of these, every, do an easy one, onshore wind farm has a big, huge crane, a Lieber 1300, and it's got a tail picker and all this stuff. You have to mobilize two cranes, even though one's smaller than the other. The same thing with offshore. You have all these specialized vessels. You have to mobilize this one vessel. is the only one that can lift these, you know, 130 meter blades or whatever it may be. We need ways, innovative ways to be able to do installations easier. And not only installations, you've got to think about operations and maintenance. So as the, the lifetime, if we get more and more of these built, yes, construction, but now we're getting to the point where we have to take and swap blades out or if there's an issue or something of that sort. So things like this need to happen. Um, does it make sense for me as an armchair engineer? Of course, uh, especially sitting here with Phil and Alan, who are much better engineers than I am, talking about moments of inertia. And this, I'm standing here with my, sitting here with my pen and my fingers together trying to figure out how this balance works. I think it, I think if there is a, a future for something like this, um, and uh, kudos to Orsted, maybe they're going to get to license it to a bunch of people. Our second idea is a degradable wind turbine blade and manufacturing method by Swancore Advanced Materials. And if you've been watching in the news about recycling and wind turbine blades, there's been a lot of discussion about creating resins that you can decompose. Well, this is one of them, and they they're 
idea is to create this resin. There's a specific chemical compound that, that they're creating. But when you break it down, you basically take the blade and drop it into an alkaline environment at somewhere around 100 degrees Celsius for several hours. And the resin separates into its intrinsic parts. You can also recover the fabric that was in the blade. So you, you basically can start over with all the ingredients. It's like unbaking a cake in a sense. This is really important because there's a big movement in Europe to not landfill used wind turbine blades. And I think that movement about not landfilling is going to happen here in the United States. So Swan Corps is really set up here for an opportunity, Phil. Yeah, and, and just for context for everybody, um, Swan Corps is a, um, a partner to a number of the OEMs already, um, including Siemens Gamesa that has developed, you know, recyclable blade, recyclable blade technology, um, utilizing, I don't know if it's this specific formulation that they're describing in this, this patent, um, but it's probably close. Um, and... Uh, you know, they're actually doing this together in, in the manufacturing facilities uh, in Taiwan as well for some of the offshore blades uh, for Siemens Gamesa. I believe Squan Core is also a supplier to um, Vestas and certainly some of the Chinese OEMs, um, uh, Sonoma and Envision Energy. Uh, so the the fact that this is, you know, again, I'm not sure if they're using this exact, you know, uh, formulation in their commercially available product. But like I said, it's probably pretty close. And, you know, it's fantastic to see, you know, we just talked about another idea from Orsted that's kind of, you know, technology readiness level like four or maybe five uh, for those that are familiar with that. Well, we track the the technology readiness levels for all these patents that we catalog at Intel Store. This one's probably a TRL eight or nine. Um, and so, again, this is fantastic to be able to see the progression of technology come into the market. Phil, to you, to your point, there's a resin much like this one. I don't know if it's the exact same one. Like you said, RWE installed in 2023 at the Kaskasi wind farm offshore. Uh, and there were Siemens Mesa blades. So something like this is being used in the field right now. My fall down on this one is the same conversation that you have whenever you talk about recycling wind turbines blades is what's the throughput of something like this, right? So what this patent says is thermal degradation is conducted 60 degrees C to 180 degrees C's for one to 48 hours. We don't know exactly what it is. I'm sure th it has to do with agitation in the in you know in the chemicals and these kind of things, but that's hugely energy intensive, and it's pretty slow. So when we get to the point where we're having hundreds and hundreds and thousands of tons of turbine blades to recycle, which we have right now, and is only going to grow and grow and grow in the next 10, 20, 25 years, because that's when when <clears throat> by the time these this resin is into manufacturing, it will be another twenty five years until we have to recycle them. Um, is it, can can a factory or can a mechanism handle this at scale in the real world? Because even as it sits right now, we have people that are having a hard time at scale grinding these things up to use them in roadbed materials and other things. So I, I like that we're moving forward in this method, and it could be something really cool in the future. Does it sound like it's ready for scale? Uh, not to me, but I hope it is. Our fun invention is an interesting one this week. Joel, do you know what beer goggles are? I wear them like every Saturday. So this is a relative to beer goggles, and it's similar to what Google Glass was at the time. Uh, it's a set of glasses, and on the lenses, they put subliminal messages above the normal sight line. So it's a stereoscopic effect. And so on there, it can say, Joel, no beer. And then it can project that out in front of you on Saturdays so that... Uh, you can remember what happened on Sunday, but the, this this idea, I have not seen this implemented, but it is a very unique idea, just putting something on the edge of your vision all the time that you, you kind of lose track of. You don't focus on it because your brain eventually just tries to ignore it, but some part of your brain may be paying attention to it and could give you some healthy advice. 
I think there's if this is this could be really used in uh I, I have a lot of uses. I'm thinking uh, marketing campaigns. You know, here's some free sunglasses to wear. And then uh, you never know what you're actually getting from them. Or even messages from, like, maybe parents to kids. Like, hey, clean your room. Um, <laughs> you know? Or maybe, me, or maybe me this week. Make sure you get my windshield repaired. You know, if it had something that you could, that you could change in real time on them, that might work really well. I like the idea. Come on, Phil. You have a use for this. Well, let, let's also give some background on this. This was originally conceived um, by a couple of Canadian inventors back in 1990. Um, and that's, they filed it. Uh, I think they filed a U.S. version of the patent in 1991. It issued in 92. This patent is actually cited as uh, what's called prior art. So kind of a previous invention um, to things like the Google Glass and some of these other goggle-based technologies that Meta and some of these other companies, Apple, um, have, have actually developed. Um, so even though this isn't using or contemplating necessarily augmented reality technology, which was you know, what a lot of the modern versions of, of these glasses are, uh, this was a, a predecessor to that and, and something that kind of inspired um, you know, derivative um, contributions in, in that area. So this, this is actually kind of a, a fun and interesting one. I, again, you're right, I've never seen anybody develop this, but it would probably come in handy 